Good morning. This morning, we are doing the recording because Christmas Eve being here and everybody is going to be with their families. So we decided to go ahead and move forward with Genesis 33. And that way we're continuing to move forward with Genesis. So let us go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us as we are coming together as a family to celebrate Jesus' birth for this Christmas. And Father, please be with us throughout our, every day when we are walking around in this world that is filled with turmoil right now, Father. Father, please keep your hedge of protection around each one of us. Continue to love and bless us every moment of the day as you always do, Father. And Father, please use us as your mouthpiece for any opportunity that comes our way to speak your word, that we uplift, encourage, and inspire. Father, please be with those that need a healing touch at this time. You know who they are and what their need is. Father, be with those that are shut-ins. Be with those that are lost right now, that do not know your way. And Father, please Continue to guide our footsteps again so we uplift, encourage, and inspire and honor you with all that we do. And Father, please forgive us when we sin and give us the knowledge that we don't continue to make those same mistakes each day. And Father, thank you for always being there for us and most importantly, Thank you for the love that you give to us. And Father, please continue to do so. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so again, today we are looking at Genesis 33. What is the meat of Genesis 33? Is during 32, we learn that Jacob had some serious apprehension to meeting up with Esau because the last time he spoke to Esau, Esau had threatened to kill him. So now in 32, we've seen that there was a lot of bartering going back and forth and they were deciding what was the best avenue for them to meet. Now, again, Esau came, was headed Jacob's way with an army. So uh, clearly Jacob was going to be concerned that he was coming after him to do harm. Well, we are going to see what 33 says to us. So in one, Genesis 33, 1 and 2, we see Jacob's careful preparation. And it reads, Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming. And with him were four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and two of the maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. He divided them up. Now, these preparations were not necessarily examples of unbelief or human wisdom and strength. Yet the order of the group showed that Jacob openly favored Rachel and her son Joseph, with Rachel and Joseph being put last. He put the maidservants and their children in front. Leah and her children were more protected than the two maidservants, Bilhah and Zilpah, and their respective children. But I also tend to lean towards was Jacob relying on his own wisdom and still not putting his faith in the Lord because he was still making steps that God did not command him to do 
and he was still moving forward with what he thought needed to happen. So we move to three, and we see that he demonstrates his submission to Esau. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. After being conquered by God, Jacob now led the procession to meet Esau. This displayed some change of character. He bowed himself to the ground. Jacob already sent over gifts and showed that he didn't take anything materially from Esau. Then by bowing down, he showed he was submitted to his brother and wanted to show and wanted no social power over him. If Jacob had not superstitiously tried to steal the blessings 20 years before, all this would have been unnecessary. Isaac's promise to Jacob, let people serve you and nations bow down to you, be master over your brethren, which was Genesis 27, 29, would have been more immediately fulfilled. It is still common to suffer some problems because we try to accomplish what we think is God's will or an unbelief to protect ourselves <clears throat> with merely human energy and wisdom. God never needs us to sin to help him fulfill his plan in our lives. Four through seven, Esau warmly greets Jacob. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants came near, they and their children, and bowed down. And Leah and also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterwards, Joseph and Rachel came near. They bowed down. So this probably, when Esau ran to meet him, this probably terrified Jacob. Surely he thought his life would soon end. Instead, God had worked in Esau, and he only wanted to bless Jacob. Fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Esau and Jacob did not feel a need to discuss and resolve the past. God worked in both their hearts, and there was no need to discuss or argue over it all again. What was in the past is in the past. Now, stop and think for a minute how that encounter may have happened. I mean... You got some serious strife <clears throat> between these two brothers. And during this, when they've, they've been apart for all these decades, I mean, it's been over two decades. And they're coming to see each other for the first time since the threat to kill the brother was put out there. They're seeing each other for this first time. So there was a, probably a lot of mixed emotions. I mean, you have the joy for finally seeing each other after such a long period of time. You would have the apprehension that you know Jacob was feeling and fear that this was going to be the end of his life. You also could have some, still some kind of internal unsure, you know, because of the things that had happened in the past. But what we need to keep in mind is that God had softened both of their hearts towards each other. So basically there was a line of forgiveness put there by both parties. So, fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Again, the joy had overcome them. They were so happy to see each other that none of the rest of it mattered. 
Who are these with you? In this scene, Jacob introduces his large family to his brother Esau. And you can imagine that kind of with every, all the women that he had children with and all those children. Remember, there was 13 of them. That would have been kind of daunting for Esau to see and to just the introduction aspect of it. So 8 through 11, Esau receives Jacob's gifts. Then Esau said, what do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, these are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please. If I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand in so much as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. So he urged him and he took it. Jacob's generous gift confused Esau. He did not expect this, showing that he had no sense of superiority over Jacob or did not have a strong sense that Jacob owed him, which also shows us a sign that Esau had forgiven him and that the Lord definitely had softened his heart. I have enough. Both Esau and Jacob have a blessed testimony. They could both say, I have enough. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Esau's peace and contentment showed him to be a remarkable blessed man, though he did not receive the promise of the Abraham covenant as he had hoped. Although Esau did not receive the great blessing, the covenant blessing, that having gone to Jacob, who secured it by deception, yet Esau did not re did receive a great blessing of a temporal kind, which Isaac pronounced upon him with all the fever of a father who loved his son most adorantly. Esau thus received what he most wanted, for he cared very little for the spiritual blessing, not being a spiritual man. And when he obtained the temporal blessing that satisfied his heart, and he said, it is enough. So he urged him. Esau receiving of the gift was an important to the reconciliation as Jacob's giving of the gifts. When Jacob gave such generous gifts, it was his way of saying to Esau that he was sorry. And when Esau accepted the gifts, it was his way of accepting Jacob and saying he was forgiven. In that culture, one never accepted a gift from an enemy, only from a friend. To accept the gift was to accept the friendship. Jacob travels to the promised land. We see this in 12 through 17. Jacob and Esau part their ways and Jacob goes to Sukkoth. Then Esau said, let us take our journey, let us go, and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. And Esau said, Now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day <clears throat> on his way to Seir. And Jacob journeyed to Sukkot, but built himself a house and made booths for his livestock, Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. <clears throat> Jacob was glad to be reconciled with his brother, but didn't want to be too close to him. He was still kind of afraid of Esau. 
Unfortunately, Jacob still acted like old Jacob instead of like new Israel. Because remember, his name was changed in 32 to Israel. Because he said he would go far to the south with Esau to the area of Mount Seir. Instead, he allowed Esau to go a few days beyond him and then head north towards Sukkoth. So he didn't go to Seir like he had told Esau he was going to. It's hard to try to be Jacob and Israel at the same time. We could have called him Jacob or Israel if you were combining both of them. So we still see old Jacob in there. God had anoint, appointed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to live in the land, but in tents as sojourners. Here, again, Jacob is disobedient and unwise by settling down. He builds a house. Yet at Sakoth, we read that he built booths, scarcely houses, I suppose, but more than tents. It was a compromise, and a compromise is often worse than a direct and overt disobedience of a command. He dares to not erect a house, but he builds a booth and thus shows desire for a settled life. In 18 through 20, we see Jacob succumbs to Seshem. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Seshem, which is in the land of Canaan. When he came from Padam Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city, and he thought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamar, Seshem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected an altar there, and called it El Elho Israel. It is good Jacob came to the promised land and he settled there, but he came short of full of obedience because it seems God directed him to return to Bethel. The altar was good, but complete obedience was better. God wants obedience first, then sacrifice. Jacob and his family will suffer in this wasted, disobedient period of time. So we see that even though Jacob has gone through the things he has, and he became renamed and did the way that he should have, he's still not being obedient by God. So, guys, that's really all there is to 33. So, what I would like to go ahead and do is move right on into 34 and get through 34 as well. Simon and Levi massacre the men of Session. So, in 1 through 4, we see the rape of Dina. A local prince violates Dinah and then wants to marry her. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Sisham, the son of Hamar, the Hebatite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. Her soul was strongly attracted, his soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Sesham spoke to his father Hamar, saying, Get me this young woman as a wife. This chapter contains one of the most shameful incidents of Israel's history. A, day, a terrible crime was committed against Dina, the daughter of Leah, but the response by her brothers was worse than the crime. When the Bible shows its leaders and heroes in such terrible plain truth, we can know for sure that the book from God, that it is a book from God. Men don't normally write about themselves and their ancestors like this. Leopold's preaching suggestions on the chapter give us an idea of this. We may well wonder if any man who had proper discernment 
ever drew a text from this chapter. It is rightly evaluated by the more mature mind and could be treated to advantage before a men's Bibles class. But we cannot venture to offer homolytical suggestions for its treatment. We remember that Jacob brought his family to a region in the promised land that God didn't really want them to be in. It seems God directed him to return to Bethel, and his time spent in the city of Seshom did much harm to his family. Jacob chose a place to live for all the wrong reasons. He wanted to be close to the city, though the city had a strong and ungodly influence. God called him to Bethel, and Jacob's poor choice of a place to live left his family open to ungodly influence. Dina's desire to do this was understandable but unwise. Jacob did not make sure she was properly supervised or protected. To allow unsupervised socialization in an immoral community was a failure of responsibility on the part of Jacob and Leah. We don't know the specific family dynamics between the parents and the daughter, so it is impossible to say to what degree Dina may or may not have gone out to see the daughters of the land in disregard to the guidance of her parents. Now, what I want you to also keep in mind, during this time, unattached young women were considered fair game in cities of the time, in which prom promiscuity was not only common, but in fact, a part of the very religious system itself. This occurrence serves to illustrate the low standard of morals prevalent among the Canaanites. Any unattended female could be raped, and the transactions that ensue neither father nor son feel the need of apologizing for or excusing what had been committed. Jacob's lack of attention and protection was partially at fault in this tragedy. His own compromise made him less able to stand up to his own children and guide them as he should have. <coughs> Jacob's children knew he told his brother Esau he would go south with him, but Jacob went north instead. They picked up on this and other areas of compromise, and use this to justify their own compromise. As for the young man named Shisham, his soul was strongly attracted to Dina, and he even spoke kindly to her. Yet we cannot say he loved her because he violated her. It was a soulish love Shisham had for Dina not a spiritual, godly, or a good kind of love. Basically, he lusted after her. He loved her for what she could be for him and give to him, not for what he could be and give to her. His heart was shown in the words, get me this young woman as a wife. He violated her. Says Sean's violent demand for immediate gratification made Dina suffer greatly and had her far-reaching consequences. He was attracted to Dina, but it had nothing to do with real love. 5 through 7. Jacob's lack of outrage, the anger of Simon and Levi. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dina, his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamar, the father of Seshem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter and the thing which ought not to be done. This section gives the impression that Jacob's sons were far more offended and outraged than their father Jacob was. Upon hearing that Seshom had defiled Dina, his daughter, he held his, Jacob held his peace and, and until the sons returned from the fields. 
Jacob's refusal to do what is right in regard to his family went encouraged two of his sons to do something, something terrible in response. When God appointed heads to not take appropriate leadership, it creates a void, which is often filled sinfully. Ancient Middle Eastern cultures had a strong sense of family honor, strong enough to use violence to defend the sense of honor. In this culture, the brothers had a greater responsibility to protect their sister than the father did. Yet the sons of Jacob would go on to defend the family's honor in an unwise and sinful way. 8 through 12, Hamar and Sesham seek to arrange the marriage of Dina. But Hamar spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Sheshom longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife, and make marriages with us. Give us your daughters to us, and take our daughters to yourselves, so you shall dwell with us. The land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Then Sheshom said to her father and her brother, said to her father and brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes. Whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as my wife. The Canaanites' proposal to marry the daughter of Jacob was a dangerous challenge to the covenant family. Irresponsible intermarriage with the Canaanites could prove especially harmful for this family with such an important destiny in God's redemptive plan. This was far more than the matter between a young Canaanite man and Dina, the daughter of Jacob. If they were married, it would set the pattern for future marriages between Jacob's family and the people of Canaan. The result would be the eventual and complete assimilation of Jacob's family into the Canaanite culture. The future of the covenant family as a distinct people was at risk. Amar and Seshon probably thought themselves generous, but their manner of negotiating the arrangement of the marriage insulted Dina and her family even more with a just name your price attitude. They acted as if money and marriage could make her disgrace go away. 13 through 17, they counteroffer it. But the sons of Jacob answered Sesham and Hamar, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dina, their sister. And they said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to anyone who would who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you, and will take your daughters to us. And we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. Their response to Sesham and Hamar was a planned, calculated deception. Hamar and Sesham agreed to such an extreme demand because circumcision was not only practiced among the Israelites, but some of other ancient people also circumcised their males. Sesham and Hamar knew of the practice from the rituals of other nations. From the beginning, Simon and Levi planned evil against Sesham and Hamar and their people, yet they covered their evil plan with spiritual words, and they used Dina as a cover for their intended evil. They felt justified because the men of Sesham treated Dina, their sister, as a prostitute, but they prostituted the sign of God's covenant for their own violent purpose. 18 through 24. Hamar and Seshon convinced the men of the city to go along with the plan. Excuse me. And 18 through 24 reads, And their words were pleased, Hamar and Seshon, Hamar's son. 
So the young man, man did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honorable than all the households of his father. And Hamar and Seshon, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Therefore let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For indeed the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives. Let us give them our daughters. Only this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people. If every male among us is circumcised and they are is circumcised as they are circumcised, will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of his city heeded Hamar and Sesham his son. Every male was circumcised all who went out the gate of the city. Despite the obvious sacrifice involved, Hamar and Seshon were pleased with this plan. Beyond the obviously deep attraction Seshon had for Dina, they were also pleased to begin to mar marry into a family so large, wealthy, and influential. Among the Canaanites of his time and place, Seshon was more honorable than others. He sincerely delighted in Jacob's daughter. The father and son, Hamar and Sheshon, had to convince the men of their community to receive the painful and possibly dangerous procedure of circumcision. They convinced them it was worth it because they could take their daughters to us as wives and take their livestock property and every animal of theirs. The potential gain of wealth made it worth it. The men of Seshon agreed, and all received the painful and potential dangerous operation of circumcision. In 25, we see the massacre of the men of the city of Seshon. Now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain that two of the sons of Jacob, Simon and Levi, Dana's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. This was not only a brutal, deceptive act, but it also disgraced God's covenant of circumcision. Surely with this clever act of violent deception, Simon and Levi showed themselves to be the children of Jacob from a bitter, competitive, competitive home environment. Crudely performed circumcisions could be quite incapacitating, incapacitating, excuse me, particularly after two or three days. So the men were good and sore, and this is when they decided to attack. They came boldly. It was a bold plan to massacre an entire community of men under the cover of their acceptance of the demand to be circumcised. It was bold in the cause of evil. The boldness with which they executed their foul plan shows the hardness of their hearts. 26 through 29, the rescue of Dina, and they plunder the city. And they killed Hamar and Seshon, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dina from Seshon's home and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain, and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, and their donkeys, what was in the city, what was in the field, and all their wealth. All their little ones and their wives they took captive, and they plundered even all that was in the houses. There was no sparing of the sword. Even relatively good men like Session were killed. The sons of Jacob justified this murder and theft by saying their sister and family had been dishonored, but the punishment was clearly excessive. <coughs> the sons of Jacob completely plundered the city of Seshem, including taking the surviving women and children as slaves. Spurgeon once said, 
by way of making some amends for their sister's defilement with this dastardly treachery, they slay the whole of the Sheshemites and bring the guilt of murder upon family which ought to have been holiness unto the Lord. So they they just went in. I, I, I mean, we don't even have a count of how many people they slayed. But they went in and just destroyed this area. And these are, this is a family that has been blessed with the covenant and they're acting in such a heinous way. So 30 through 31, we see Jacob's reaction to all of this. Then Jacob said to Simon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? In response to the terrible massacre and plundering of Sesham, Jacob seemed to only be concerned with himself and the danger of retribution against his small family. There was no concern for right and wrong, for God's righteousness, or for death of plunder of innocence. This was Jacob, not Israel in action. All was out of order, threatened to become much worse. Even the heathen outside began to smell the ill savor of Jacob's disorganized family, and the one was alternative was mend or end. Barnhouse once said, Jacob, you brought the trouble on yourself. You passed your own deceitful nature into your boys. You set them a constant example of guilt. They heard you lie to Esau at Penal and start northwest after he went southeast. They saw your interest in a fat pastures when you pitched your tent in session. You said nothing when Dina was violated. Talk to God about your own sin before taking to these boys, talking to these boys about theirs. Barnhouse was actually correct there. He's saying, you know, take a good look in the mirror there, buddy. You know, you're, you have really been one ball of a disaster when it comes to examples, but you're going to sit here and lecture them. Don't do as I do. Do as I say. Well, we see it more times than not. Children carry the sins of their father. Should he treat our sister like a harlot? This was Simon and Levi's only reply. They were correct that the sister Dina had been abused and treated terribly, yet none of that justified their outrageous evils of mass murder, enslaving women and children, and theft through plunder. When Jacob was about to die, he professed over each of his twelve sons. This is what he said about Simon and Levi. Simon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their counsel. Let my, not my honor be un, united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hand-strung an ox, cursed by their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. He saw Simon and Levi for who they were, but he rebuked them far too late. The prophetic word of God through Jacob proved true. God did, in fact, both divide the tribes of Simon and Levi and scattered them among Israel. But significantly, the way it happened for each tribe was different. The tribe of Simon, because of their lack of faithfulness, was effectively dissolved as a tribe. And the tribe of Simon was absorbed into the tribal area of Judah. The tribe of Levi was also scattered, but because of the faithfulness of the tribe during the rebellion of the golden calf, 
which is in Exodus 32, 26 through 28. The tribe was scattered as a blessing throughout the whole nation of Israel. But both were scattered, but one as a blessing and the other as a curse. So there was a lot that went on right there in 33 and 34. We see some very heinous acts and we see why it eventually led to them being dissolved and explains a lot to the sins passing from the father to the sons. And we see a lot of disobedience from Jacob and his sons. So that covers 33 and 34. I know I covered a lot of material today. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out, let one of us know. And we will be moving on to Genesis 35, which is the revival in Jacob's life next week. And we should be meeting together for that one. So let us go ahead and move forward and go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, let us take what we have learned here today and apply it to our walk with you. Let us continue to grow in that walk and let us be great beacons of light for you. And Father, please continue to hold us in the palm of your hand, keep us safe and doing a righteous walk next to you and be a great representative of you, Father. Do not let us be as Simon and Levi or even Jacob and take matters into our own hands and think it is pleasing to you. Father, please continue to allow us to reach those that may not know you, Father. Let us be great mouthpieces for you. And Father, Please continue to just keep us on the right path. And Father, thank you for all that you do each and every day for every one of us. And Father, please continue to be there for us as you always have been. And allow us to be great pictures of you. I ask all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Guys, that is going to conclude this lesson. I hope everybody has a wonderful Christmas, that everybody's safe and enjoys time with your family. So again, guys, Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful day.